Hello, my friend. Before we begin this episode today, I have to give you two heads up. One, a heads up about a potential glitchiness, and another, the heads up about a potential life-changing opportunity. So number one, we are changing hosts of this lovely podcast. And as we do, we wanted to let you know that if you're having trouble with the player or trouble accessing an episode, that might be why. It should only last for a couple of days. And we apologize in advance for any inconvenience. So that's that. The life-changing opportunity I want to give you the heads up about is my Fall Crucible project. Crucible is seven weeks of community and coaching and motivation to help you take a long-held idea and turn it into a reality. I ran this program for the first time in the spring, and it was so amazing. People made podcasts, people launched blogs, people created brand new offers, people finally took action on a long overdue rebranding of their business. People started writing books, people stopped giving away their intellectual property and started to create something of their own around it. It was phenomenal. So of course I'm doing it again. The next crucible will go from September 8th through October 27th. So we are going to catch some of that Virgo back to school energy and we are going to harness it into creating something so that you get to end the year 2023 having done the thing, having stopped talking, stopped dreaming, stopped doubting about it, and having actually done something. So if you are curious about this, if you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to know when the doors open, go to bit. Dot Lee, so B-I-T dot L-Y slash crucible list, crucible list all squished together. And that will take you to a place that you can get on the wait list and have very first dibs for the spots that open, very first dibs for early access to many of the program materials, one of which is a hypnotic track that works wonders without you doing anything at all. It's just the best. If you would like to be there for the early bird pricing, then the place to be, again, is on the Crucible waitlist, which you can find at bit.ly slash crucible list. All right, my friend, thank you so much for listening to these quick little announcements, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to Mind Witchery. I'm your host, Natalie Miller, and I'm so glad you're here. Hello, my love. I'm so excited to share with you today a conjuring episode, a conversation with a fellow witch in the world. Today's conversation is with Esme Weijun Wang. Esme is a writer. She is a novelist and a memoirist and essayist. She's written The Border of Paradise, which is just an enchanting novel, like a, an engrossing novel. And The Collected Schizophrenias, which is her award winning collection of essays that both explores and describes what it's like to live with chronic illness and also works to dispel misconceptions surrounding the condition of schizophrenia. In addition to this, Esme is a gifted speaker and presenter, and she's also 
the leader and creator of The Unexpected Shape, which is a community in which writers come to develop their craft and also learn to create in a way that honors their physical and psycho-emotional limitations. I remember when The Unexpected Shape was just a tiny little seed of an idea, and I'm so thrilled and delighted that it is now a resourceful reality. Definitely check it out if you are a writer. In today's conversation, Esme and I talk about a lot of things, but I decided to title this episode Conjuring Self-Honoring Ambition, because that's really what stuck with me from our conversation. So often, ambition is coded capitalist, right? Who are the ambitious ones? It's the ones that'll like, do whatever it takes to succeed. And I loved Esme's conception of ambition in this conversation that we had that's really more than anything about going for it about making the most of this life. And as you know, I am very here for that. So please enjoy this conversation between me and Esme Weijun Wang. Hello, my love. Hello, good morning. Hello, this is, my dear listener, the one and only Esme Weijun Wang. She is an extraordinary writer. She's authored a novel, The Border of Paradise, which will haunt you <laughs> if you read it. <laughs> it haunts me. <laughs> um, she's the author of The Collected Schizophrenias. She is an award winner. But more than that, actually, Esme, I want to talk about you as a revolutionary, because that is how I think of you as a writer. I think of you as a revolutionary because you are leading a community and also like an ethos, I think, mm. of a very different way of approaching writing mm. and a very different way of thinking about the practice of writing. So I'm mm. so excited to talk to you today about that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about it too. And I think the funny thing about talking about the way that I teach writing or the way that I discuss writing is that it really expands to cover a lot more ground than just writing. I run something called the Unexpected Shape Writing Academy, which is an online writing school for ambitious writers living with limitations. But what I teach so often applies to anyone living with limitations who want to do anything that's at all ambitious regardless of whether that's writing or painting or raising children or whatever a person might want to approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe we can say it's like expression. Um, mm. I, I think of all of those things as kind of being in this expression category, right? Like a place where you're like, okay, I want to make something in this yeah, world. Yeah, it's creation, you know, yeah. like, especially with child rearing. I mean, what could be more creative in the very literal sense of the word than mm -hmm. child rearing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ambitious people living with limitations. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about ambitious real quick. Cause yeah. I think <laughs> and it, it's right. It's such a, it's such a word ambitious. What do you think when you think ambitious? It's really interesting. I think there is a sort of recent backlash against the word ambition, which is so interesting to me. Mm. There's been these more vocal revolutions of rest um, active rest, especially for communities of color that are really focusing on anti-production um, as a form of anti-capitalism. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's really interesting. And I, I love to observe and engage with those communities. But when I think of ambition for myself, I, I think of it as a 
project that I'm constantly working on in terms of figuring out what ambition is for myself. So mm. you know how like people will collect URLs, just like you think of it, <laughs> yes. you think of something and you're like, oh, I'm going to buy the domain name for that just in case I make mm-hmm. something someday. So I've had the URL rethinking ambition for a long time. And even though I have not like created a course or like written a book with that phrase in particular, I do think that rethinking ambition is a really large part of my life and a part of all the projects that I create and I'm a part of. Mm-hmm. Well, I will say, actually, every time you said ambition, immediately what comes to mind for me is the Dolly Parton lyric from nine to five, that that is what Dolly does in the morning. She pours herself a cup of ambition. Mm. And, and I think for me in ambition is like this desire to go for it. Mm hmm. I am pro that. I am also pro rest, mm-hmm. but I don't know, As may, and maybe you resonate with this. I came here to make stuff. I came here to create. Mm-hmm. I love to create. I love to make. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. to reshape. I love to challenge, right? Like I'm, mm-hmm. I, I like to be a prolific person that feels so purposeful to me. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you share that? Yeah. So all of that is how I feel as well about creation, about writing, about the business that I run. Um, But so often the word ambition gets tangled up with this lean in girl boss brand Mm -hmm. kind of concept, which is Mm -hmm. often or usually quite toxic in our Mm -hmm. culture and not helpful for people or good for their bodies or spirits or Mm -hmm. emotions or minds. So I think of ambition for myself as a feeling of excitement, as a feeling of wanting to go for it. It's not this feeling of pressure or wanting to win awards for the sake of winning awards or feeling Mm. pushed by other people or you know, my parents or, you know, people I love or people who love me. It's, it's this thing that comes from within myself that may or may not in some part be impacted by society and the way that society thinks about success, but is also really tangled up in just the delight of making things. And Mm -hmm. in particular, in the delight of writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not the kind of ambition that has you climbing ladders, right? Like Mm -hmm. all of those Mm -hmm. ladders and all of those um, very narrow kind of capitalist, patriarchal, white supremacist, ableist, like that idea Mm -hmm. of ambition as that kind of impulse or desire from the inside is very different from the idea of ambition as like getting to the tops of the ladders to claim the prizes. Yeah, it's a lot like legacy is another big word that I talk about a lot and think about a lot. And so when people think of legacy, they often think of, oh, so, you know, your obituary is going to talk about how you had a New York Times bestselling book, or you were an award winner for this, or you achieved that or this. And for me, Legacy also includes the day-to-day things that you do that make an impact on other people. I think that Mm -hmm. the words legacy and impact can be really interchangeable. So if you're really kind to the cashier at the coffee shop, that will make an impact. If you, you know, are are giving a dollar to someone who is panhandling on the street, that makes an impact. And so Mm -hmm. I think that those gestures and daily things that may not be headlines in newspapers or mentioned in your obituary, those are just as much of a part of your legacy as anything else. So mm. so for me, these words like ambition or legacy or or any of these things, they can be tangled up in these uglier, more pushy versions of themselves. But when they are left their own devices and allowed to flourish 
and take shape, they are really beautiful. Yeah. And it's almost like when we claim and define them for ourselves, um, because of course there are all kinds of people who are not supposed to be ambitious, right? Right. Like who like the powers that be would prefer if we stayed in our places and didn't have ambitions or didn't want to think of ourselves as even worthy of creating legacies. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are lots of people who would rather Greta Thunberg be less ambitious than she is. So, you know, there's that too. Yeah, exactly. So ambitious people living with limitations. Mm -hmm. I know that means specific things to you. And I'm curious if you could expound upon that a little bit. So again, I think that this is one of those concepts that is really expandable. It's like a buckyball in that you can start really small and then it stretches really big and Mm. it looks really different depending on what angle you're looking at it from. So for my purposes, it usually means people who are living with chronic illness or disability, but... I think that limitations come in all kinds of different forms. People's insecurities form limitations. The amount of money that you are able to make form limitations. The way that society treats people who look like you form limitations. There are all kinds of limitations, some of which you can control and many of which you cannot. And so I purposefully leave the word limitations as kind of a big blank slate that people can write on and define for themselves. Hmm. I'm just holding for a moment that this kind of paradox, right? How does one push the limit meaning like push some of these limitations, especially the ones imposed by structural inequalities, right? How do we challenge those and at the same time honor their effects on us? So the academy that I run is called The Unexpected Shape, as I mentioned before. And I really like to talk about why it's called The Unexpected Shape, because I think it says a lot about what I think about limitations and how I think about limitations. So this particular concept of the baseball diamond came from my friend Anna's father. So I think of the unexpected shape as like a baseball diamond and life is like a baseball game. You know, baseball is played in a very particular way. There is the diamond, there is home plate, there are uh, different plates for a second, third. When you play and you hit the ball, It would be really cool if you could go from first base to like home directly or from first base to like third base directly. Mm. I mean, it would just be so much easier. You could get so many more points if you were able to uh, just run to home plate or just stay at home plate Mm -hmm. and gather points that way. But that's just not how baseball is. There's a reason that baseball has that shape of that diamond it's because that's what the game is that's how the game is played and so when I talk about the unexpected shape I'm talking about how we don't know how our lives are going to look really from one day to the next or one moment to the next and so our lives are these constant flexing fluctuating shapes that are often unexpected and we have to learn how to play within them. Mm -hmm. And I'll go a step further, which I I think you'll come out with me on this branch. (laughs) And learning to do that is actually the fuel and the inspiration and the impetus for making, for creating. Mm -hmm. I know for me, for example, I created last year my time witchery planner and it's kind of, uh, it's an anti-planner. It's not really a planner. It's an anti-planner because I, as a person, need a lot of flexibility 
in the shape mm-hmm. of my day. I'm like super empathic. I'm very sensitive to everything, the light, the heat, like you, you name it. Mm-hmm. And what I'm up for energetically, emotionally really shifts a lot from day to day mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. every other. And, but at the same time, I fucking love a planner. <laughs> like I love mm-hmm. to sit mm-hmm. down and to think about like what I want to do for the day. And, you know, I'm very ambitious. I have a lot that I want to be happening. And so time witchery was really born from me saying, okay, what would it look like to have a place that both honors my sensitivities and enables my, I'm going to use the the ambition word, enables my ambition, right? Like actually Mm -hmm. supports it. That was made from I think, my experience of unexpected shapes. Yeah. And I think that the creation of that planner is one example of what I call workarounds. So I also have a course called Dream Hunting with Limitations, which used to be called Ask Kicking with Limitations. But so much of that concept is based on the idea that we have to figure out workarounds to get to our definitions of success or Mm -hmm. to get at our goals, which I think are more concrete definitions of success. So one really classic example that I use is that when I was in graduate school and I hadn't become chronically ill yet, I could sit and write for seven to eight hours at a time. And I did that every day. I would just sit and, you know, have endless cups of coffee and write. And then at a certain time I would switch to gin and tonics and then I would write (laughs) and that was my day. But once I became ill, I couldn't write on a laptop for even 10 minutes. I couldn't sit somewhere and type for an extended period of time. So Mm. my question became, okay, just because I have these new limitations doesn't mean that my ambition has shifted. I still want to write, but can I do this? And so I was wondering, okay, my first book was written before I became chronically ill. Can I write a second book while I'm living with these limitations? And so the thing that I discovered that ended up being my saving grace was I wrote almost the entire text of the collected schizophrenias on my iPhone on a drafts app while lying in bed because it was so much easier for my body to be lying down and typing or rather tapping because I just use one finger Mm -hmm. very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I ended up writing that way. And so that was a workaround. And I think that sometimes the workarounds that people come up with can be as creative as the creative thing that we're trying to do. The workarounds that people come up with in life are so interesting to me. I'm such a process nerd and I love learning about how people make things work for themselves when life makes them hard. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because I think that because our pedagogy is so kind of teacher led and because our culture is so like expert fetishizing, (laughs) I think Mm -hmm. so often what we are looking for is like, dear expert person, please tell me how. Like, how do I do it? Like the guru on the hill. Totally, right? It's like, how do I do this thing? You must know because you are, you know, the James Beard chef. You are the the New York Times bestselling author. You are the, I mean, Lord help us. You are the seven-figure business owner, right? It's like, Mm -hmm, please mm -hmm. tell me, how do I do it? And what I hear there and what I, of course, like 100% believe is that it's actually so individual how Mm -hmm. we make things work for ourselves. And I think a lot of 
that is less about having one expert or the sage on the stage giving you the answers to whatever your dilemma might be. It's much more about, for me, asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I do this with my students, obviously, as well. And And I love to share different things that might work for them. But I try to never say this is exactly how it is because that is my tendency, I think, as a person. I like to joke that I have no actual opinions because I'm so easily swayed mm. by arguments. If I if I think one thing and then you know read a particularly convincing op-ed, I might start thinking in the other direction. Mm. But it, I think this happened a lot, and I realized this a lot when I was writing The Collected Schizophrenia. So I decided early on that what I didn't want to do was to become – a mental health or schizophrenia expert that would become a talking head every time CNN or the BBC or whatever needed someone to talk about schizophrenia because of some news story. I, what I say the collective schizophrenia is, is, and I, you know, in the, I talk about all kinds of things that I do have opinions about. I write about involuntary hospitalization or involuntary treatment or forced treatment or the policy that schools, um, colleges, and universities often have regarding sending their students away when they're having a mental health crisis. What I don't do really is to say this is always bad and no one should ever do it. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is to gather lots of information and present it to the reader And basically say, this is the information that I have and that I found. And I would like it if you could make your own decision about what you think Mm. makes sense based on what I've shared with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a more interesting way of writing. Although I may just be saying that because I can't write in any other way. Um, But I think it's such, uh, yeah, like it's not in me to be particularly pedantic, even though I am a teacher, I mostly want to share. And when I teach writing, I'm always saying, I'm sharing, this is how I do it. And this is how lots of people do it. I'm sharing with you lots of different methods, but there's no law saying you have to do it the way that I do it. Mm -hmm. Please do what works for you. If this doesn't resonate with you, please just leave it and try something else and Mm -hmm. find the thing that does work for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, don't discount it or don't like apologize for it, right? The thing that works for you works. I don't know if you've had this experience, but I've certainly had this as a teacher is, you know, people saying, well, I mean, this is what I'm doing. Is that okay? And I'm like, hey, if it's working for you, if it feels good for you, you are the expert in you always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if it works for you and it's not harming you, you're you're not harming yourself in some way. I, I tend to to really boost whatever my students want to do. It's so interesting that you mentioned that kind of question of is this okay? Is this the right way to do it? Mm. I was trying to think as I was listening to you mention that, I was trying to think if my students actually asked that question. And I don't think they do, which is really interesting to me. I think that part of it, though, does come from the fact that so many of the students who come to the academy are chronically ill or disabled and so are so used to finding ways to make things work for them and knowing that if it works for them, it works for them. You know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of this mentality that that shapes your view of the world, that shapes how you see things, that shapes how you approach things. One of my most popular pieces of writing that I've ever done was for Elle, um, and it was called something like, I'm chronically ill and afraid of being lazy. And it had to do with this feeling of uh, being a really type A ambitious person becoming chronically ill and not being able to work as much as I used to and not being able to 
be as productive as it used to be. And so I think that's something that a lot of chronically ill and disabled people have to grapple with. Because again, to circle back to the beginning of the conversation, because we live in a society that very much gives out stars or gives out prizes to whoever is the most productive. If you're not productive, then you're not a good member of society. And so figuring out what can make life work for you, what can help you to fulfill your own ambitions, whatever those are, is such a part of chronic illness. Mm -hmm. I love that reflection that um, if you're living with a chronic illness, you are already creating and finding your adaptations like it's almost as if like that muscle is built up like yeah mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. you know that the capital the capital way doesn't work for you so you've already had to figure it out like what a fabulous kind of unexpected asset and strength to to have and to lean into and then i would also just say though as may also that um i'm sure that it is like the ethos of your own community that also encourages that kind of individualization, right? When I think about teaching, I'm usually teaching for like another organization and everybody is worried about getting it right because I think there is maybe a subtle or not so subtle implication that there is a right way. Yeah. It's funny. There's an app. I will not mention its name. There is an app that purports to allow you to be so much more productive because if you plug in your, you know, key events, so the the appointments and such that you can't move, and then you plug in the tasks that you have to do, it will automatically plan out your entire week for you based on those tasks and those appointments. But this app cracks me up because it generally fills up your entire week. And it makes this assumption that I think is really funny. This assumption that everyone is going to be able to work at any time of the day. It doesn't take into account maybe you'll have a migraine or you'll start to have a migraine in the morning. And so your entire day is wiped out or it doesn't take into account. Maybe your kids are going to get the flu. And so your very carefully AI drawn out plan is kaput Mm -hmm. because of that, because your kid is barfing everywhere. Mm -hmm. I did end up trying that app because I was like, oh, well, let's see if this does anything. But I never ended up being able to follow the plans that it made for me. Yeah. And I think things like that, they have this intention of being able to optimize humanity. But it's our humanity that makes these things very unhelpful. Yeah. Well, and, you know, as a coach, I'm also thinking, gosh, that app is also assuming that a plan and Mm -hmm. schedule and deadlines are actually motivating for the person. Mm -hmm. Like, like for me, Esme, what you just described, that is a level of hell. It's a very low (laughs) level of like, if, if I arrived at hell and they were like, here's how your life works now, I would be like, yes, well played. This Mm -hmm. is like torture. This is terrible. This Mm -hmm. is torture for me. Yeah. That would never, ever work for me. You know, when we think about productivity, because I, I think and write and talk about this a lot too, I actually, to kind of loop back that idea of being a process nerd, I think a lot about what we're prioritizing in productivity. It's like most of productivity is prioritizing product and not Mm -hmm. only product, but quantities of Mm -hmm. product not mm-hmm. quality and not like the ivity part, which is which is like how it happens, which is process oriented. And for me, 
that focus on product over process, on quantity over quality, that is, I, I'm going to say, and this is bold, but I'm going to go for it. That is dehumanizing. It like takes all the magic out. It takes all the like juice out of it for me. Yeah. I mean, it's like the saying, the journey is the destination becomes the destination is the only thing that matters and F the journey, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. get to the destination. However, uh, in the fastest way possible, just zap your way to the destination and mm -hmm. there's nothing worth having in the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you made a post on the gram that inspired me to write to you and to say, hey, let's <laughs> have a conversation about this. And that, that post was about how the way that we're told to build a writing habit, or we can expand that to say any kind of habit, right? like mm -hmm. any anything you want to create. If you want to create like more endurance for walking, if you want to create great meals, if you want to create ethical children, right? whatever it is mm. that you want to create. Um, it's toxic because it's shaped by ableist assumptions about our bodies and minds, and then sexist and classist assumptions about basically like our whole lives, right? Like you mm -hmm. said, this idea that, oh, this person should probably be free from nine to six, always mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. in that same post you talked about how um really what you think about when it comes to productivity and i'm i'm saying this in like a process oriented productivity are limitations resources and then like kind of rubber meets the road what we need to do to meet our goals and so i would love to just explore that a little bit together with you for my dear listener. Yeah. So I have this class, which you can purchase on my website called building a writing habit while living with limitations. And I came up with that class because I was thinking a lot about Stephen King's very famous, very lauded book called on writing and how much I hate that book and how much I hated that book when it came out because everybody was saying, Oh, you should read this book. It's so brilliant about writing, but what Stephen King says about what a writing habit should be just made me so angry. And it was something like, if you are not writing every day for X number of hours per day, it means you don't care about writing enough and you're not really a writer. And I found that over the years after that book came out, it was primarily women that I would talk to who would say, it does not work for me to write every day. That's not a realistic thing for me to do. That's just not part of my unexpected shape. And so I started thinking about, okay, so if I'm a person who's living with limitations, which again, that is a big umbrella and covers a lot of things, what are the things that I can use to figure out what a writing habit can look like? And I think like one of the first things for me at least is that means it doesn't look like the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. And that already throws a wrench into the gears of a lot of people's ideas of what a habit is. You know, because like I said, you might have a migraine or you could, might get sick or, you know, anything can happen. But what you can do is to evaluate, like you said, your resources and you can think about workarounds and you can think about what would feel good for you in order to build a quote unquote habit. Mm -hmm. um, does a habit have to be in something that is every day? No, in my opinion, no. So, you know, if you have certain kinds of resources, though, you can give yourself more ability to do what you want to do, in this case, writing. So your resource might be money. So you can trade money for time and energy. Um, you can hire people to clean your house mm -hmm. using money. 
Or if you don't have money, if money isn't one of your resources, maybe you have a family network. Maybe you have a really tight knit family and you've really cultivated these relationships with your family and you can find a cousin or a sister who can watch your kids for a few hours every day so that you can go and write. So yeah, I think about these different ways of approaching building a writing habit and what it really means to make sure that you can have a life that has writing in it. Because the whole point of having a writing habit, in my opinion, is that you are writing some amount and that doesn't necessarily have to look like the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had to really rehabilitate my relationship with writing after graduate school, Esme. I went, I was just in an, in an emotionally abusive PhD program. Like I know everyone is like, oh yeah, that's grad. No, my graduate school, like (laughs) my graduate school sent people to institutions. Like it was really rough. And I couldn't write for years Mm -hmm. because it was just so devastating, the the kind of criticisms and humiliation that we were put Mm -hmm. through in this program. And I found that part of my own kind of like (laughs) psycho-emotional rehabilitation around writing also involved declaring to myself that everything counts. Everything counts. So Mm -hmm. no matter what I write, if it's a letter to a friend, if it's a clever Instagram post, if it is like lyrics to a song about my dog, (laughs) like like Mm -hmm. everything counts. I just started this kind of radical celebration of creativity and it made a huge difference for me. So such that like even sometimes what counts as writing practice for me is reading. Yeah. So I think to circle back to our conversation about productivity, that is why in my restorative journaling class, I like to teach the idea of creating a things I did today list, because I think people with chronic illness are constantly, like I said, beating themselves up for not being productive enough. There are so many people who at the end of the day are just like, I did nothing today. And what I challenge my students to do is to look back and say, is that really true? Did you really do nothing today? Did you brush your teeth? Oh, you did? Okay. Put that on your list of things I did today. I brushed my teeth. Did you take a shower? Okay. Put that on the list because showering is really hard for a lot of chronically ill people, I consider taking a shower a really huge task. So it's getting in the habit of, of building that muscle. Like you said of, for you, it was things I did today that are writing or in terms of reading, um, like writing relevant or Mm -hmm. writing adjacent. Mm -hmm. And I think even just having that list and then being able to look back at the end of the day and see, oh, I didn't do quote unquote nothing today. I actually did a lot of things. And that in itself, I think is a really important component of quote unquote productivity and being alive. Yeah. There are so many spells in here today, Esme, that I just want to kind of tease out from this conversation just to say that what I'm really hearing is this what we can do together to embrace our ambition, to give ourselves permission to define ambition, define legacy for ourselves, to give ourselves permission and like credit for being experts, for being productive, for being um, committed to this like growth even with limitations, even with planet Earth as challenging as planet Earth is in this moment. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that's just kind of what I'm hearing again and again is like, no, we're, we're, we're claiming this for ourselves. We're figuring out how to make it work for us and even mm-hmm. what it is, what it is that we're making work. Yeah. A phrase that people really associate with me is, and I even had this put on a mug um, at, at one point is keep going. You're doing great. Keep going. You're doing great. And I say it a lot on social media. I say it a lot in real life. But the reason I think that is such a powerful series of phrases or series of sentences is that keeping going is no small thing. Keeping going if you're a marginalized person, if you are a person who uh, is dealing with mental illness, if you are, you know, whatever you're dealing with, it is not easy And if you're alive, if you're putting one foot in front of the other, I think you're doing great. And I think it's that appreciation of that movement forward, getting through the seconds of the day, that I think is one of the most powerful acknowledgments that I can make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the bottom of the daily page of my uh, my anti-planner are appreciations. Cause I think, right. When we appreciate, we give more value to, it's like, okay, let me appreciate, you know, the shower that I Mm -hmm. took today. Let me appreciate the, the sentence that I wrote, (laughs) right? Like it was a Mm -hmm. sentence and I want to give it, I want to, I want it to appreciate in value. Um, and I find that, 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 practice of of appreciations of giving ourselves credit and really honoring that yeah showing up and keeping going is doing great is doing great Mm -hmm. I love that well Esme thank you so much for joining me today it was so fun to talk to you I would love for you to let people know you mentioned so many different workshops and courses and of course the unexpected shape where's the best place for people to go to see this whole menagerie of offerings that you've created okay so i'm really excited about my website so i'm always asking people to go to my website which is at esmewang.com if you want to learn about the unexpected shape writing academy it's at unexpectedshapeacademy.com And uh, I'm also really active on Instagram. So if you are an Instagram person and you would like to follow me there, I am at Esme W. Wang there. So that's it. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. All right, my dear listener, I hope this inspires you to claim some of your ambitiousness for yourself and then also to begin to explore who maybe all summer long begin to explore what really works for you what is your unexpected shape of bringing what you want into the world thank you so much for listening and bye for now Thank you for listening to this episode of Mind Witchery. To catch all the magic I'm offering, please subscribe to the show. Or if you want a little bit of weekly witchiness in your inbox, sign up for my Sunday letter at mindwitchery.com. If today's episode made you think of a friend or loved one, your sister, your neighbor, please tell them about it. We need more magic makers in this troubled world. Like all good things, this podcast is co-created by stellar people. Our music is by fabulous DJ, artist, and producer, Shammy D. Our gorgeous art is by the sorcerers at New Moon Creative. Mind Witchery is produced in conjunction with Particulate Media, K.O. Myers, executive producer. And I am Natalie Miller. Till next time.